Okay. Well, we have lots of things uh, to talk about and not a lot of time. Uh, I did bring Gilbert uh, so you'd see there's at least one intelligent representative of the Searle family here today. Uh, and uh, Gilbert attracts a lot of attention. I've discovered a slight statistical difference between uh, male and female responses. Uh, women are inclined to say, how beautiful. And uh, guys are inclined to say, he's big. Uh, I don't know if this gender difference marks any significant sociological difference, but in any case, I've noticed it. Uh, and if, if, at times during the lecture, I have to reassure Gilbert that I'm really here for his benefit. He, he gets very insecure. Okay, well, gosh, we don't have an awful lot of time, and I don't know what uh, we should be talking about, but I'm going to move rather rapidly through a series of topics today. Now, there's an ambiguity about next week. By long tradition, um, I teach in the last week, but don't introduce any new materials. In other words, I use it for review, and I will hand out a sample exam questions, and then you can ask questions about the questions, about how what would be an intelligent sort of answer. And I'll tell you now <clears throat> that when it, <clears throat> it comes to examinations, I, I encourage my colleagues, and I myself follow the policy of asking the following when I'm reading an, an answer. Uh, does the student answer the question? And you'd be surprised how often uh, they don't answer the question. And that's, that hurts the feeling of the poor examiner because, you know, he worked hard thinking up the question and you didn't even answer the question. So uh, there's a question that has the word Frega uh, in the question. So people, oh yeah, think, yeah, Frega, I remember something. And then they write down everything they can remember about Frega. That's not it. Read the whole damn question uh, and try to answer the question. And then secondly, I ask, uh, do they know the material? Are they actually familiar with the stuff? Did they learn anything? And then third, uh, can they think philosophically? If the questions are well designed, and of course that's not always, uh, they're not always well designed, but I like to make them well designed. If the questions are well designed, you should have some scope for original ideas. And then fourth, and I realize this is maybe asking too much, but uh, can they write their thoughts in English sentences? Uh, and that, uh, you don't always get that. The all-time record was uh, when I first started teaching in Berkeley, a guy managed to write a three-hour exam in which there was not a single grammatical English sentence. And he was quite annoyed when I explained to him that this did not lead uh, him to get a very good grade. And he told me he was a chemistry major <laughs> And nobody had ever asked him to write an English sentence on a final exam. It was always a formulae or multiple choice or something like that. Now, paragraphs, I think, are probably too much on, a, on an exam like this. But sentences are uh, much appreciated. Uh, finally, I, though I'm the last guy uh, to insist on this, it'd be nice if, you, if, the, if the writing was legible. I write illegibly myself, as you will have noticed on the blackboard, so I'm the wrong guy to complain if other people write illegibly. But the poor person reading appreciates it if you can write it so they can read what you're actually putting down. Okay, what should we talk about? Well. Uh, I'm going to talk about several subjects today. Uh, one is, I want to finish discussing Chomsky. Uh, and then second, I'd like to talk about uh, forms of representation other than sentences, and in particular, pictures. What kind of a speech act is a picture? Uh, and what are the possibilities of pictorial representation? And then at some point, I don't know if this is the day or if we get that far, but at some point I'd like to say more explicitly how my approach to the philosophy of language differs from the mainstream. Uh, I think that the mainstream philosophy of language is wrong, and I guess I have to write a book explaining why. I wrote a book explaining why mainstream philosophy of mind was wrong. It's called Mind, A Brief Introduction. And it was helpful to me to sort out my ideas. But the, the mainstream philosophy of mind is obviously wrong. It's either dualism or materialism. And they inherit a whole lot of 17th century muddled vocabulary. And they're still struggling with it. And they have various dumb theories like uh, the mind is really a computer program, or the mind is just behavior, or, you know, it's all kind of obvious mistakes, and it's kind of fun to point them out. 
Uh, the mistakes in contemporary philosophy of language are much more sophisticated. Uh, the level of intelligence at which the work is done is much higher. But at some point, I'd like to say explicitly how the approach that I've adopted in this course differs from what you would find in the standard textbooks, or for that matter, in standard courses in the philosophy of language. Okay, so here we go. Item number one, uh, Chomsky's revolution in linguistics. Uh, there is no question uh, that Chomsky is the most important linguist of the past century. Now, you could argue, well, that uh, Saussure uh, also revolu revolutionized the subject in his time, but I think uh, Chomsky's uh, effect is decisive. And one of the ways to see that is to see that though uh, Chomsky's answers are by no means universally accepted in the discipline, people are busy addressing his questions. So even when they don't agree with his answers, they're busy trying to struggle with his questions. Uh, now, what was the question uh, that he gave uh, to linguistics in a very sharp form, and which I think is still uh, a, a, a dominating question today, and that is the task of the part of linguistics that Chomsky thought was central, namely syntax, uh, the task of a theory of syntax is to state precisely a set of rules that will, de that will actually generate all and only the sentences of a language. So a theory of English, a theory of English syntax should give you a set of rules which if you follow those rules would give you all of the English sentences. Now that's an infinite number, so the rules, as you know by now, have to be recursive. You have to have a device that enable the same, and enables the output of the same rule uh, to be subject to the application of that rule over and over, as with, for example, the formation of relative clauses. But the idea is to get a set of rules which uh, all, uh, which if you follow those rules, will give you all of the possible English sentences and only English sentences. It won't give you, any, give you any ungrammatical sentences. And in the early days, and we're going back a long time now, uh, Chomsky made what he thought was an important discovery, namely that the kind of rules that you have for, form, uh, for forming formalized languages such as those that you get in, in mathematical logic, uh, they won't work for natural languages like English. Uh, and it, that the rules are, in those days, now I'm, this is already obsolete, I'm going to tell you how this was altered, but the rules were of this form. You take a symbol, S, for sentence, and you have a rule that says when you have S, you can rewrite it as noun phrase plus verb phrase. And then you have rewrite rules that tell you for noun phrase, you can have a determiner plus a noun, and for a verb phrase, you can have a verb plus a noun phrase. Okay, now if you follow those rules, then eventually you get uh, to a list of terminal rules, such as a rule that for the determiners that will list, for example, the or a, uh, those are possible determiners, and for uh, nouns, uh, they will list things like dog and cat. Uh, and for verbs, they will list things like uh, eat uh, uh, and hit, etc. Okay, and the idea then is if you apply those rules over and over, you get a kind of a tree structure for any sentence. So the tree structure will look like this. You have the sentence consists of a noun phrase and a verb phrase. The noun phrase consists of a determiner plus a noun. The verb phrase consists of a verb plus another noun phrase, and then you get to the uh, terminal elements of each of these, determiner plus a noun, uh, and in the, uh, uh, the way that this uh, finally comes out in the, in the last form is you have, for example, the boy the boy hit the ball, where uh, this is the a determiner, this is the noun, uh, this is the verb, 
uh, this is the determiner, and this is the noun. Okay, so you get a tree structure. It's kind of an upside-down uh, tree, or it's a right-side-up Christmas tree. I never get the metaphor right, but in any case, the sentence consists of a noun phrase plus a verb phrase. The, ver the noun phrase consists of a determiner plus a noun. The verb phrase consists of a verb plus a noun phrase. And then the determiner can be the a uh, or the or any of these other articles. Uh, the noun can be boy, dog, cat, man, uh, tree. And then the verb can be hit... Uh, 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 see, um, uh, uh, sit on, or any a number of other such verbs, and then the determiner again will be the uh, plus uh, the boy hit. I have here the boy hit the boy, but let's have the boy hit the ball. The boy hit the ball. Okay. Now the idea is that that gives you rather simple English syntax, but it's not adequate. It won't do for actual languages because there are sentences of actual human languages which simply cannot be explained by the application of these rules. And if you take a sentence like, flying planes can be dangerous, or another one, visiting relatives can be a nuisance, oddly enough, those sentences are ambiguous. But they're not ambiguous because any of the words are ambiguous. The words are perfectly unambiguous. The sentences have a syntactical ambiguity. So flying planes can be dangerous can mean either planes which are flying can be dangerous or it can be dangerous to fly planes. And those are two different meanings of a sentence even though none of the words are ambiguous. The words are all perfectly unambiguous. Similar visiting relatives can be a nuisance can mean either it's a nuisance to visit relatives, where relatives is the object of the verb visit, or it can mean uh, relatives who visit are a nuisance, where relatives are, is the subject of the verb visit. Now, how is that possible? How is it possible that there can be a set of sentences where the Expressions in the sentence are perfectly unambiguous. They're, they're not like uh, a, a word like um, a bank, which can be ambiguous, can mean either the side of a river or a finance house. I went to the bank can mean either I went to the bank and went fishing, I went to the bank and cashed a check, because uh, that's an ambiguity in the word bank. But none of these words are ambiguous. Flying planes can be dangerous, visiting relatives can be a nuisance, and yet the sentences are ambiguous. Now, that's a peculiar kind of ambiguity because it's an ambiguity in the syntax. It's a structural ambiguity. And once you look around, those are everywhere. Take the sentence, I like her cooking. Uh, now, that can mean a whole lot of different things. It can mean, I like the stuff she cooks. I like the way uh, she cooks. Uh, I like the fact uh, that she uh, cooks. Uh, I like her when she is cooking, and it even, uh, but not otherwise. But it can also have, it has a, a, a cannibalistic interpretation. Uh, I like her when she's being cooked, uh, I, 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 is another possible meaning, and so on. I, now, so you, here's a perfectly ordinary English sentence, I like her cooking, but it's many ways ambiguous. Now, what's the explanation for that? Well, Chomsky said, in addition to these rules called phrase structure, rules, you have a set of rules that enable you to transform phrase, uh, the outputs of phrase structures into other structures. And those rules don't just operate on a symbol in virtue of its shape, but they operate on a symbol in virtue of its history, how it got that shape, how it got to be that particular form. Uh, and those rules are called transformational rules uh, because <clears throat> they transform the output of other rules into a new output. And the early versions of this grammar were called transformational grammar. And in the early days, in the 60s uh, of the last century, there was an enormous amount of enthusiasm because people thought at last now uh, we have got this type of formal apparatus that will enable us to at last get a theory 
of natural languages like English or French or German. It will get a theory of these languages which will be a precise theory. It will be mathematically precise in the sense that the rules won't rely on your uh, implicit understanding. You, you, they're the kind of rules that a computer could just apply over and over and they will generate all and only the sentences of languages like English or French and the rules will have two kinds. There will be the transformational, there will be the, the, the phrase structure rules like the ones I have on the blackboard and then there will be the transformational rules that operate on the output of these rules to produce a new output. And the early days this grammar was called transformational grammar because it required transformational rules in addition to phrase structure rules. Uh, and it was sometimes called generative grammar or more because it generated, the idea was to generate uh, uh, the sentences of a language by the repeated application of these rules. Now why is this supposed to be any different from uh, the uh, uh, traditional grammar that you're supposed to have learned in so-called grammar school uh, where you learned how to form English sentences. Well, the idea, Chomsky said, and I think correctly, was that traditional grammars don't give you a precise statement of the rules of the language. They rely on your standing, understanding. They know, uh, you're supposed to know that something is a direct object and something is a subject, uh, and you rely on that. Uh, in your understanding of the rules. But these rules were completely formal. Again, as I said a moment ago, they're the kind of rules that can be applied over and over by a computer. You don't have to understand anything to apply these rules. Okay, there was a lot of enthusiasm, and this enthusiasm was increased by the fact uh, that Chomsky and his colleagues said, furthermore, you have a distinction between the surface structure of the sentence and the deep structure. The deep structure is generated by these phrase structure rules, but then you have to get from them to the surface of the sentence, and you get that by the application of the transformational rules, which operate on the output of the deep structure. And then there was an exciting hypothesis. All of the facts about meaning are in the deep structure, whereas the facts about uh, pronunciation, how you actually produce the sentence, uh, is in the surface structure. So as Chomsky once said, if, if, if we could just communicate without having to say anything, we would just throw deep structures at each other. We'd throw tree structures like that. But we have to be able to talk in a linear fashion, so we got to get from those uh, deep structures to something you can actually pronounce, and that's the surface structure. Okay, it was a beautiful theory, uh, but it failed. Uh, and it didn't work for a number of reasons. I mean, I can tell you all kinds of reasons why it didn't work. One is uh, the idea that the transformations didn't change meaning is obviously false. Uh, you have to have a difference between uh, the man stepped clumsily on the snail and clumsily the man stepped on the snail. Now, According to Chomsky, those would have the same deep structure uh, because it's just a matter of the transformations where you put clumsily. But in fact, uh, you remember now our discussion of scope. The scope there is different. Uh, clumsily, the man stepped on the snail means it was clumsy of the man to step on the snail at all. But the man stepped clumsily on the snail, uh, on the snail means the man snapped, stepped on the snail in a clumsy fashion. Does everybody see that? It's like uh, the difference between uh, it ought to be the case that Jones e e eats his vegetables and Jones ought to eat his vegetables. It's the difference between the scope of the operator uh, in the case of clumsily and you can't handle that. In, uh, uh, if you make the distinction between the deep structure and the surface structure and you think surface structure isn't supposed to alter meaning, that the transformations don't alter meaning because this one does alter the meaning. It alters the truth conditions of the sense. So for a large number of reasons the project failed. And now, you remember last time I told you all of these arguments that were given for there being a universal grammar. That failed too. And I'm going to tell you uh, uh, about that, and then we're going to put these ideas together. Okay. Now, I remember last time I said, it looks like you've got to postulate that the kid knows at a very, uh, at birth, uh, the kid knows in some sense of no, that is, he has structured in his brain, he's got built into his brain the capacity to learn any natural human 
language. Children will learn any language quite effortlessly uh, if they're given exposure to it uh, at a certain age. And yet that's a remarkable intellectual feat because the uh, languages are uh, a very complex but the child acquires, acquires uh, this knowledge of the language at an age before his or her intellectual capacities are developed. It's not, uh, it, 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 it's not a general application of, of uh, learning uh, abilities as when a child later on might learn the geography of the town it lives in. Uh, it's not a function of intelligence. Uh, kids, uh, smart kids and dumb kids both learn the, the same language. Uh, you don't have to teach them. The kid just picks it up. Uh, and the evidence that the child relies on is very imperfect. Uh, that's, uh, this is a slogan for this. It's called the poverty of the stimulus, the actual stimulus that the child hears is uh, imperfect in various ways. And you can see that the child is in some sense inventing the language. When you look at how uh, kids overgeneralize, uh, so for example, a standard thing that children will do is overgeneralize uh, uh, the past tense. They will say, uh, I, 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 I walk and I run, and then they'll get the past tense, I walked and I runned. Well, it ought to be a past tense, but it's not. It's in, Eng in English, it's irregular. And in fact, kids will invent new words. I remember my oldest son uh, invented a word that didn't exist in English. He invented the word ament, as in, I am a good boy, ament I. Now, there ought to be a word, ament, if you think about it, like isn't, wasn't, aren't. There ought to be ament. Why isn't there a word, ament? Well, I checked it out. There is uh, uh, such a word. It's ain't. Uh, and ain't, it's hard for English people, English speakers to say ament because it's got a mm combination and that's for some reason we find that hard to do. So it got shortened to ain't and as you know ain't ain't in the dictionary so the children are discouraged from using ain't. But that's a good case where the kid simply general, simply invents a word to fit the imperfect data that he's heard. And this is very common with uh, uh, children. The children will will overgeneralize uh, and get new words, uh, and the past tense is the obvious case of this, uh, where the irregulars have to be learned on an ad hoc basis. You can't just apply the general rule, and what the kid does is apply the general rule. What Thomas was doing in this particular case was applying the rule to form the negation of the copula, ad unt. Uh, to the copular, as in isn't, wasn't, and aren't, but then there ought to be, that rule ought to apply to am, as in I am a good boy, am and I, but it doesn't. So, But this is pretty good evidence that the child isn't just acquiring words that he's heard, but rather he is inventing a grammar, he's inventing a language on the basis of the imperfect and degenerate data that he acquires. Uh, okay, so Chomsky then said, uh, and uh, it seemed plausible, that look, really, uh, all languages are really uh, the same, uh, and they just have these surface differences. See, the argument against universal grammar had always seemed decisive. The theory of universal grammar is that all human languages are manifestation of the same underlying grammar. The argument against that had always been the languages are so different. If you look at Chinese and Swahili and Japanese and Tagalog, they're so different that uh, they couldn't possibly be expressions of the same underlying grammar. Now Chomsky's answer to that was quite in ingenious. It was, on the surface they look different, but if you look at the deep structure, in fact, they're pretty much all the same. And the task now of the theoretical linguist is not just to state the rules of English or French, but to state the rules of universal grammar that all languages have in common. And as Chomsky said over and over, if a Martian linguist could come to Earth and learn the languages that we speak on Earth, uh, uh, he would conclude, uh, basically we all speak the same language, uh, we just have different vocabularies. You have to learn the vocabulary of 
Chinese, and there are little uh, 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 surface differences that are different. The Germans have this habit of waiting uh, until the end of the sentence before they get to the main verb, so you have to wait around forever until uh, you get to the main verb. Das hätten sie sehen sollen, und das hätten sie hören sollen, and, and in, those, in those cases you've got to wait for the Zolan to come at the end. Uh, but um, I, essentially, it's pretty much all the same language. Okay, so we had a situation uh, in the early days, in the glory days of MIT uh, linguistics, it looked like um, that we really had a science of language, or at least a science of syntax. Uh, why did it fail? Now, uh, to begin with, that's a question begging way to put it. I, 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 I wrote an article. Uh, in the New York Review of Books a few years ago in which I said that the project had failed. And I lost a lot of friends. Uh, Chomsky hasn't spoken to me, at least not in words that I could repeat uh, since then. Uh, and I, I had to get rid of the emails because they were so, I mean, they were burning up the computer. Uh, so uh, they don't think that it failed. But I think that, uh, that after 50 years, I, I, Chomsky's first book came out in 1957, so we're talking about 53 years. The problem is that there is no uh, rule that competent linguists agree is a valid rule of universal grammar, or for that matter, a valid rule of English. Uh, and that ought to worry people. If it's going to be a science like chemistry or physics, well, you don't have these passionate debates among uh, 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 chemists uh, over the nature of compounds. Uh, for example, over the, over, uh, the uh, number of uh, carbon rings uh, in organic uh, compounds or uh, on uh, the uh, structure of the hydrogen atom. So what happened? Well, I, again, I don't know what happened. I mean, I think you'd have, it would take a lot of intellectual history uh, to go through this. And there's a peculiar sociological phenomenon in most disciplines of philosophy, for example. Uh, the older generation gets overthrown uh, by the young Turks who come along uh, and have revolutionary new ideas. And then the young Turks become the older generation, and they get overthrown. In turn, there's this sort of pattern uh, in academic life. But uh, and Chomsky managed to be his own young Turk. That is, every 10 years he overthrew uh, his previous uh, views and announced a new uh, scientific revolution. But the, and, and that was very, I mean, that's very encouraging in a way because it means that subject is never boring, is never sort of an established uh, boring set of truths. But it's disconcerting if you think that it's going to be a hard science. It's going to be a science like physics or chemistry. Uh, because there are uh, uh, now in the year, uh, in, well into the uh, 21st century, there don't seem to be any established results. Why not? Well, as I said, and I'll repeat, I don't really know, but I can make some suggestions. An early objection that I made, and I made it in print, was that you can't do this kind of a, a, a structure without at some point asking yourself, well, what's the purpose of having noun phrases? And what's the purpose of having verb phrases? That is, you can't uh, do the syntax without some reference to the use that the syntax is going to be put to. That you cannot treat syntax as a purely self-enclosed system without any reference uh, to the meaning or the function of these expressions. You can't understand what a noun phrase is if you don't know what it is to refer to something or talk about something. You can't understand what a verb phrase is if you don't know what it is to say something about something. Uh, and Chomsky always objected to that. He said, no, the, uh, the rules, the, this was called the autonomy of syntax. Syntax has to be completely autonomous. Uh, you have to have uh, the, the rules which make no, which are purely formal in the sense that these rules are purely formal. They just tell you to rewrite something, or they tell you when you've got an output of a certain transformation, uh, then you can insert it into another tree structure in a certain way. Uh, but I think in the end that's going to fail, that you really will not understand uh, what the uh, what the structures are unless you understand what they do. It would be uh, trying to figure out what the, uh, 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 the operation of the eye without ever considering the fact that eyes function to see with, or with a, 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 
the operation of the uh, digestive tract without figuring, without taking account of the fact that the digestive tract functions in a certain way uh, in the ecology of the organism. And similarly with language, you won't figure out what the structure of the sentences is if you don't know what they function to do. Uh, in any case, that was one objection. Now another objection of this, and this was an interesting objection to universal grammar, is uh, that they found languages, by they I mean one guy, Ken Hale, uh, found languages in Australia which really were unlike any of the languages that Chomsky had uh, described, which really seemed counterexamples to the thesis of a universal grammar. I mean, I, and Hale was not, uh, there, there was a, a, an unpleasant a polemical uh, flavor to much of this debate, but that wasn't true of Hale. Hale was very much a disciple of Chomsky, and he's one of these, he was one of these guys who could pick up a language in a couple of weeks. You know, there are these remarkable people who just absorb new languages and have no difficulty acquiring them. His name was Ken Hale. He died a few years ago. Uh, and, and so he and Chomsky published an article together uh, saying, well, the, the idea that there's a single set of rules of universal grammar, that doesn't work uh, because there are the languages in, in the Australian outback that Hale discovered that don't meet these rules and presumably there would be other languages as well. So they modified the theory. Now what you do uh, if you're ingenious is when you get a refutation of your view, you announce it as a discovery. And what they discovered was not that there are rules of universal grammar, but rather that there's a universal set of principles. And the principles are then triggered by the child's exposure to particular languages. Uh, and then that exposure uh, to particular languages will set a certain set of parameters. So the principles will be perfectly general, but they're not yet in the form of rules. Rather, the big piece of machinery in your brain has a bunch of switches on it. And when you hear French, if you're a little kid, the switches get set in a certain way. If you hear Chinese, they get set in another way. If you hear English, they get set in a third way. And each of those settings gives you a set of parameters, and those are the parameters of specific languages. So the innateness hypothesis survived, the hypothesis that there's an innate mechanism in the brain that enables the child to learn any language. But that innate mechanism in the brain does not consist of a set of rules. It consists of a set of, of principles, general principles for treating languages. And those principles are triggered in specific ways by specific exposure to specific languages. And the upshot of that is you get a set of parameters which will give you, which will give the child uh, the uh, understanding of French or German or English or Chinese or whatever uh, the language in question is. Uh, okay, now there have been a number of uh, revolutions since then, uh, and now the latest is, well, we ought to think of the, actually the rules of the grammar as being very small in number. It's called a minimalist approach to grammar. But my own objection to this whole project, as I said before, is you can't do the syntax by itself. Syntax is a tool that functions uh, to uh, enable people to talk with. That's what sentences are for. Sentences are to perform speech acts with, and you've got to understand something about speech act theory if you're going to understand these structures. Um, and there was always a puzzle. Well, how could language have evolved? on Chomsky's view. And in fact, when I worked with him at MIT, I used to ask him, but how on this view that you've got all this apparatus, how is it supposed to have evolved? How did it evolve out of pre-linguistic cognitive capacities? And basically, I, the people I talked to at MIT just got very cross. Uh, if you ask them, how could this have evolved? At one point, Noam told me, uh, well, we don't teach evolution at MIT. Well, what are you talking about? You teach creationism? No, of course not. Um, <laughs> but I, this I came to be called the Big Bang Theory of the Evolution of Language. There was one fine day, we all, there was a Big Bang, and we all woke up with a generative, with a universal grammar in our brains. 
Now, lately, uh, there is some work on how language could have evolved in the light of this. And there's an article that you can find on the web by uh, Hauser. Hauser, Chomsky, and Fitch. And there they do have something to say about how language might have evolved. But basically, uh, this, is, uh, this whole project that I'm describing you is still a work in progress. Uh, my guess is uh, that it will fail for the reasons that I stated. It will fail b uh, because in order to understand structure, you've got to understand function. In, the, in, in human evolution, structure and function do not operate independently of each other, or any kind of evolution for that matter. Um, but it's very much ongoing, and you can look, if you're interested in this, look at the review that I wrote of Chomsky's latest book in the, uh, in the New York Review of Books, and then look at his reply to me and my reply to his reply. Uh, okay, so that's really, I, I want you to know some about this because it's a, an important part of intellectual history. It's like my teaching you Russell's paradox. It's not something I'm going to ask you about on an exam, but you ought to know about because it it's an important part of uh, contemporary intellectual history. And Chomsky's revolution in linguistics, an ongoing project, I think is an important development. Uh, I think it failed, but I, I don't say that with, I mean, there's a lot of times I can tell you something failed. Uh, strong artificial intelligence failed, and I can demonstrate that. Uh, Chomsky, I can't uh, demonstrate that Chomsky's project failed, uh, but still, after 50 years, the fact that there are no established results ought to worry people, and I suggest uh, my own view of the reason that there are no established results uh, is because you can't do it. You can't do structure without function. Now, the, the other thing about, well, what is it about the brain that enables us to acquire all of these languages? That's an exciting question, and we really don't know enough about brain function to know the answer to that. Okay, uh, I'm going to stop talking about linguistics and, and take questions. Uh, by the way, there's, there's a kind of uh, hostility uh, uh, in, among linguists, which is rare. Uh, well, even philosophers don't get that mad at each other. And I think the reason is that the uh, linguists feel it ought to be a science. There ought to be established results. And if the results, if you don't get other people to agree with my results, uh, they must be bad people or dumb or both. Uh, whereas philosophers kind of recognize everybody's going to disagree with you anyhow. Now, it's true in some areas of philosophy, I get, mo I get more hostility than I do in others. By and large, philosophers of language are pretty civil. Uh, in the philosophy of mind, there's a kind of nastiness uh, that reminds me of uh, MIT linguistics, but it's unusual in philosophy. Okay, uh, let's take questions about that. I've tried to really give you a sketch of uh, two parts of the Chomsky and Enterprise. Uh, the, uh, the actual structure of the early days of uh, generative grammar, what was called a standard theory uh, uh, in the early days of generative grammar, and also to give you some of the issues about universal grammar and what was called the innateness hypothesis, the hypothesis that any child can acquire any language because there's an innate mechanism. Chomsky always hated the expression, the innateness hypothesis, because he says anybody's theory has got to say there's some mechanism. I mean, uh, David Hume would have to say there's some mechanism of association. I, I, so. Uh, innateness doesn't distinguish, uh, but I think it's not a bad expression because what it says is that there is a specific, a, a species-specific mechanism. That is, it's specific to human beings. My, I won't say his name or he'll think I'm talking about him, but there's a, a, a D-O-G over there whose name is G-I-L-B-E-R-T. Uh, and he cannot learn language. Why not? He's pretty smart. Well, he doesn't have that mechanism. The mechanism is species specific. It's specific to the human uh, species, and it enables any normal human to acquire any natural language. Now, one last thought, and that is it has to be done at a certain age. Uh, it, uh, the wolf children and so on who are uh, brought up by the wolves, if, they don't, if they're not exposed to language by the time of adolescence, it's very hard to teach them. And there's a horrible story of a girl who was kept in a closet in Los Angeles and never uh, exposed to language. 
and they got her out of that closet. I think she was already 13 or 14. <laughs> and the UCLA linguistics department tried to teach her English. And they, they, they did this. Uh, the, the woman in charge was Vicki Frumpkin. And, and uh, 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 Professor Frumpkin did a wonderful job. They kept it out of the newspapers. Uh, she was, uh, they were very sensitive with this uh, person. Uh, and they did teach her some things, but it was uh, not much, and it was obvious that she was never going to be a normal native English speaker. Uh, but then a horrible thing happened. Her parents, having mistreated her, got her back. They got her away from the parents, but the parents went to court, and having brutally mistreated this unfortunate girl, they got her back, and she lost all the language that the UCLA linguists had managed to teach her. I don't know what's happened to her. You might uh, check this out on the website. Uh, check out on her, Vicky, I forget the girl's name, but it's Vicki Fromkin. Is, what's that her name? I forget, but is that it? Okay, but you might check that out and let me know what, what uh, the latest word on that is because uh, the last time I heard, she had lost all the language that they had managed to teach her. Okay, questions about all that or about uh, contemporary linguistics? All right, I guess everybody's agreed to that. We'll go on to another subject. Let, uh, let, I mean, I'll take a drink of water and uh, console Gilbert for the fact that I haven't been paying attention to him. Uh, and you can think of a question, and then we'll go on to a different topic. As a good doggy, you sit. Okay, just sit. Okay. All right, I'm going to have a drink of water. I didn't bring any drink for, for uh, Gilbert, but he'll have to survive until the lecture's over. Okay, any, no questions about, yes? Yeah. Yeah. Well, okay. Uh, the question uh, raises um, I, I, another important issue that I have mentioned earlier but never went into any detail, uh, and that is what are the general relations between language and cognition, and specifically, how do different languages affect your cognitive capacities? Now, as I've mentioned uh, to you, uh, there was a famous hypothesis advanced most famously by Benjamin Lee Whorf. That's an H, W-H-O-R-F. Uh, and the idea of the Whorf hypothesis is that differences in language are reflected in differences in cognition in a rather dramatic way uh, so that if you have a really different sort of language, you have different cognitive, uh, uh, you have a different metaphysics, you have a different way of seeing uh, the world. Uh, now, uh, this was also advanced by a Berkeley uh, anthropologist named Sapir, so it's sometimes called the sapir Whorf hypothesis, and Nietzsche scholars uh, uh, purport to be able to find the same thesis in Nietzsche N-I-T-Z-S-C-H-E. Uh, so it's something called a nietzsche sapir whorf hypothesis. And basically, it's kind of an exciting idea. Namely, uh, your metaphysic is a result of your language. And there's something appealing about that. I mean, we have in, in the Western Euro European style of metaphysic, which, which we're all brought up on, uh, the idea that there are a, a world consisting of objects. Uh, substances, and substances have properties, uh, and substances have essence that determine the kind of thing there are. And so the story would go, the reason we believe that, that there's substance, essence, property, all of that kind of stuff, is because that's how our language is constructed. It's constructed in the noun phrases and verb phrases, and that just reflected in our metaphysical view. And Worf had wonderful examples. Uh, Worf's an interesting guy, incidentally. He was, in fact, uh, an insurance salesman who got interested in language, and he actually became a vice president of the Hartford Insurance Company, uh, but he became more famous for his work on language than his, uh, in, I don't know what kind of insurance salesman he was, but he certainly had an effect on the, our thinking about language. And he studied the Hopi language, and, and his, uh, he gave a lot of examples, uh, things like the following. If the Hopi have one word 
that means uh, there are five white fence posts on the left belonging to my brother-in-law. That's one word, I, I, example I'm inventing, but it's the kind of thing you get in Wharf. Uh, then surely they see the world differently from the way we see it because we would want to break that thought up into a whole lot of uh, different parts in a way that the Hopis don't do. Uh, okay, now I think it's fair to say that the, uh, the Sapir-Whorf uh, Nietzsche hypothesis got refuted or at least it got discredited. It turns out that closer examination of the Hopi language reveals uh, that Whorf has just misdescribed it. He didn't understand it very well. Yes, you get these uh, long words, but you get those in Turkish where a whole lot of morphological bits are tuck, stuff stuck onto one word. That's, uh, but there are different meaningful units in that word. It's not as if they didn't break up the thought into its different components because they managed to put it together in one word. So the empirical data on which the Whorf hypothesis was based have been uh, discredited. But there, is, there are certain survivals of it that are quite interesting. Um, uh, Dan Sloban in our psychology department has a wonderful experiment where he presents children with a sequence of pictures. And in these pictures, you see a kind of narrative happening. You see the pictures, uh, the boy is walking uh, across a field, and then the boy climbs a tree, and various things happen to the boy. And you ask children to describe what's going on in the pictures. And interestingly, different languages describe it differently. So in English, the English-speaking kids will say, the boy climbed the tree. But the Spanish-speaking kids will say, the boy is high in the tree. They will say, esta alto. See what's going on. The English speakers describe the process, climbing, and take the result for granted. He's high in the tree. The Spanish speakers describe the result, esta alto. He's high in the tree. And they take the process as implied. Uh, and that's an interesting difference. I mean, I think, but that's a much more modest uh, thing than anything that you find in uh, Nietzsche, Sapir, and Warp, which was the idea that our whole metaphysical view is determined by the syntax of our language. Uh, I think, I mean, th I'll tell you the difficulty was always how do you treat this as a testable empirical hypothesis? If you ask these people, yeah, and what's the evidence that the metaphysic is different? Well, the metaphysic, the evidence is that the language is so different. You know, they got one word that means there are three white fence posts on the left belonging to my brother-in-law. Uh, and that's the evidence that their metaphysic is different. But that's circular, because you're saying, uh, because they have this different language, they got a different metaphysic. Oh, yeah, and what is it about the metaphysic, the difference? Well, it's a different language, and that's not going to do. You can't make that work. But if you take it more modestly in a way that, uh, that um, um, Dan Sloban does, then I think you get a kind uh, uh, of, uh, uh, you get some interesting results how the same data will be described differently uh, by speakers of different languages. But, uh, if, but the bottom line, though, is that in, at this particular phase in intellectual history, uh, the, the Sapir-Whorf hypothesis has been discredited. It's no longer taken seriously among people who work hard in this area. Okay, yes, you had a question. Yeah. I was just going to say, we both took a course in here called Language and Thought that kind of examples yeah. the extent to which mm -hmm. and examines experiments and stuff. And for anyone that's interested, it's a cool class. Yeah. I mean, the whole yeah. So it's a basically a course about this, about this issue. Yeah. How to test it and, yeah, the more moderate. Yeah. Uh, more moderate versions of it, yeah. Well, I think there is a more moderate version. I, I know their Slobin's not the only guy who does this, there are other people as well. Okay, other questions? Yes. Um, you said that you didn't um, think that the set of universal, universal principles is necessarily true, but I was just wondering if you think that there are constraints specific to language or just yeah. general words? Okay, I, I, here is um, I, I, a deep question I should have gone into and didn't, and that is uh, it's clear that you've got to say uh, that there's something different between me and my favorite uh, Bernese mountain dog I, that enables me to learn English and him, he can't even learn uh, Switzerdeutsch, uh, which is where his ancestors came from. I, there's got to be something different. Now, the, the, here is the question. Is that difference a language-specific mechanism or is it part of general intelligence, part of general learning strategies? Is it the fact 
uh, that uh, it's a part of the same fact that I can learn science uh, in a way that this uh, a, a brilliant dog though he is, he cannot learn even simple Newtonian mechanics. Uh, uh, so what, uh, what is the nature of the difference? And again, I, I don't know the answer to that, and I don't think anybody does. However, it seems reasonable to suppose that language is specific in a way that, for example, vision is specific. Uh, I can't do what bats do, namely navigate by echolocation, by bouncing sound waves off of walls. I can't do that. That's how bats navigate in the dark. And that's not because I'm dumber than the bat, but because I don't have the specific mechanism for that. So it seems to me reasonable to suppose that the way we acquire language is by a, a species-specific language acquisition mechanism. So far, so good. What's the nature of the mechanism? We don't know. And that's where I, I'm stuck now. I think there must be a mechanism. Uh, but I, I'm very suspicious of both of the idea that the mechanism consists of a set of rules and that it consists of a set of parameters that where the uh, a set of principles where the uh, a specific exposure fixes parameters because that seems to me just a way of naming the problem and not actually solving the problem. I don't see how that's a solution. Okay, I'm going to shift gears now and talk about something else. Um, I'd like to talk we, uh, the the general theme of the course has been about how language rates, relates to reality, I, and uh, the general form of the answer is it relates to reality because uh, speakers so relate it in the performance of intentional acts, which are generally called speech acts. Um, they needn't be spoken, they can be with gestures or writing or whatever. Now here's an interesting point, and that is human beings have a way of representing reality through pictures, by depicting it. And it, the question then arises, well, what is it about the picture, which after all is just a series of marks on paper, or uh, nowadays a, a series of stimulations on a, 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 stimulations of a computer screen, what is it about uh, the physical object that enables it to function as a representation? Now there's a common sense answer to that, uh, which a lot of theorists have rejected, and I want to begin by defending that, and the common sense answer is, pictures differ from sentences because the way the picture represents a person or an object or a state of affairs is by way of resemblance. There has to be an actual physical resemblance between the object, which is the picture, and the entity which is represented by the picture. Uh, now, I think that ha something like that has to be right. I mean, uh, the reason uh, they don't use passport photos uh, or driver's license uh, pictures just for fun, but because they actually work. They enable you to identify or they help to identify the person who is the, uh, the owner of the driver's license or uh, the bearer of the passport. You have to look at least something like the guy depicted on the picture. However, there are skeptical answers about that, and there are two forms of skeptical answers that are, well, I guess, well known. Uh, one is by Nelson Goodman, and I think the book is called Art and Illusion, and the other is by Richard Walheim, uh, and I think that book is called Art and Its Objects. Uh, so it's Goodman and Walheim, they both are skeptical about the idea that pictorial representation operates on a different principle from linguistic representation, the principle being resemblance between the object which is the picture and the object which is represented. And the arguments go as follows. I, I Goodman's argument, I think, is rather bad, so I'm not sure I can give a sympathetic presentation of it. But here's how it goes. If you actually look at a picture and you look at an object that it's supposed to be a picture of, they don't actually resemble each other. I mean, uh, the, a picture of Winston Churchill is two-dimensional. Uh, the actual guy is three-dimensional. Uh, what the picture looks like is other pictures. 
They're flat objects with a bunch of uh, ink stains or marks on them. Uh, but Winston Churchill is not a flat object with a bunch of ink stains or marks on him. So pictures don't look like the objects depicted. They look like other pictures. And if you actually had to do a sort of a, a topography of the picture, a, a, a kind of a, a geometry of its structure, it resembles other pictures. It doesn't resemble any actual three-dimensional objects. It couldn't. It's a two-dimensional surface. Well, I don't think that's a very impressive argument, and I think the reason is one you know, namely, the objects in which the picture is supposed to resemble the object depicted is the uh, features under which the picture represents the object depicted. Of course, if it's a flat two-dimensional picture, it's not supposed to represent the object as being flat and two-dimensional. Rather, it's supposed to represent the object as looking like this from this point of view. It is a convention of picturing that uh, when it comes uh, to humans, we try to depict the person uh, either in photography or in portrait painting uh, from uh, the point of view of the face, and in particular, the face seen head on. I hope I'm not erasing something precious. I probably am. Uh, but there are conventions about picturing. If I say, uh, well, I'm going to draw you a picture of Winston Churchill, uh, there it is, and I say, well, yeah, but, you know, what's going on? Well, that's his left nostril uh, seen looking upward, and you can see the hairs in the nostril. Well, okay, I don't, maybe his left nostril looked like that, but that's not the way we normally depict people. So it's, it, uh, you know from this course that all representation is under an aspect, and the point about pictorial representation is the aspect under which the object is depicted is precisely the aspect under which there is supposed to be a resemblance uh, between uh, the object uh, and the picture. All right, but now Wallheim has a deeper, a more uh, philosophically interesting objection. I mean, the, the short answer to Goodman is uh, he doesn't understand that representation is always under aspects. And of course, the idea that the picture resembles the object doesn't mean it represents it under all aspects. It just represents it as that's what the guy looks like seen head on uh, at point blank range in broad daylight. That's what, what they're trying to achieve with the passport photograph. And I, 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 the um, uh, uh, expensive portrait painting. And, the, and again, always ask yourself, well, what are the conditions of satisfaction? And the conditions of satisfaction of the picture are that it's supposed to look like the object depicted. Uh, okay, but now we've got a deeper objection in Walheim, and that objection goes as follows. Yes, says Walheim, the object does look like the picture. There is a resemblance between the picture and the object. But that resemblance will not explain the pictorial relationship because that resemblance is precisely pictorial resemblance. So the guy that you see in the picture uh, doesn't resemble the guy as a material object. Rather, the guy in real life looks like the man in the picture. Now let's think about that expression. The man in the picture. You identify something as the man in the picture only because you've mastered the practice of pictorial representation. And indeed there is a resemblance between the man that it's a picture of and the man in the picture, but you're able to understand that resemblance only because you already have the background practice of pictorial representation. Hence, the resemblance is internal to the practice of representation and cannot be used to explain it. Does everybody get that objection? It's an interesting objection, not a dumb objection. The idea is, look, we don't want to deny the common sense idea uh, that there is a resemblance between my passport, my driver's license photograph, and me, 
Otherwise, uh, they wouldn't let me uh, uh, on the airplane if there was no resemblance at all. There is a resemblance. But that resemblance cannot be used to explain pictorial representation because that resemblance is part of the practice of pictorial representation. It's only given pictorial representation that we're able to see the resemblance. And the next step might be, I don't think Walheim went this step, but one would be, uh, uh, Gilbert, for all his intelligence, can't see uh, the pictorial relation. He, he, he sees me on television, he gives no sign of recognizing me. There's no point in saying, come on, look, Gilbert, this is a video of a program I did. He doesn't pay any attention because he has not got the practice of pictorial representation. Now, uh, by, by the way, early puppies do get fooled by mirrors, but they soon learn that it's not to be taken seriously, and they learn uh, to ignore uh, uh, the mirror. Uh, okay, so while I'm as a more interesting objection to the view uh, that uh, pictorial resem that the pictorial representation is explained by pictorial, come welcome back. We missed you. Um, uh, uh, but <clears throat> in any case, what should we say to that? Well, I think there's something right about it, but I don't think it has the skeptical uh, impact that Walheim thought. And the answer is this. You can acquire the practice of pictorial resemblance by just uh, looking at actual physical resemblances. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, the K person sees his or her reflection in the lake, and you detect immediately uh, a resemblance between the reflection and the thing that is reflected. Uh, it's clear that the wall, uh, the cave paintings in Lascaux and other, uh, the other early uh, places where the cave paintings were made uh, 50,000 years ago, and they're stunning. I'm sorry you can't, when I first went there, you could just walk in, you'd par walk up and uh, park your car and walked in. You can't do that now because people breathe on these damn cave paintings and they wreck them. But you can still get in and see them behind glass, and they're quite stunning, but it's pretty clear that these people thought they were painting objects on the surface of the cave that looked like actual animals that they were hunting. Now, why they did it, we don't know. Uh, I doubt that they did it for purely aesthetic reasons. They thought, well, uh, this here's an aesthetic achievement that will last uh, for centuries. No, they, they had some other aim in mind. But all the same, there is no question that it operates by physical resemblance. We have no difficulty in spotting that these are pictures of animals, and even no difficulty in spotting what kind of animals there are. So I think Walheim is right that once you've acquired the practice of pictorial representation, then you can spot resemblances which will be internal to the picture. But the resemblances that you spot that are internal to the picturing relation are themselves built on top of resemblances that are brute physical resemblances. Now, one of the things that's interesting is to look at the history of art. Uh, for centuries, the artist was trying to get as close as possible to an actual likeness and the effort in the case of, let's say, Vermeer or Velasquez, uh, the effort to get an actual likeness is stunning. Uh, the best picture that Velasquez painted is Las Meninas. I, when I had to go to Madrid a couple weeks ago, you remember I couldn't lecture, I went back and it is as great a picture as I remember it. In the flesh, it's even better than the reproductions. I got so excited about that picture, I wrote an article about it. It's called Las Meninas and the Paradoxes of Pictorial Representation. It's kind of a dumb article, but, I, uh, but you can read it if you're interested. You can, uh, you can, I, I assume you can find it on the web. But in any case, there was clearly an effort to produce something that was an exact likeness. Now, in the case of, of uh, uh, Velasquez, he had these rich aristocratic uh, royal patrons, so he had to kind of dress him up a bit, make him look better uh, in the picture than they probably did in real life. Uh, Goya didn't do that so enthusiastically, and it's hard not to think that some of Goya's pictures are sarcastic and ironic because the royal family looks so ridiculous. Uh, by the way, in the Prado, you can see these pictures uh, within about 100 uh, uh, yards of each other, that is, there, or even that, 30 yards of each other. They're very close to each other in the actual museum. Okay, now once, pic once photography came along, uh, there was a kind of crisis, and there were different ways of responding to the crisis, and one of the most exciting ways 
uh, was uh, the development of Impressionism and post-Impressionism. And it's hard for us to recover today uh, the revolutionary character of the Impressionist and the post-Impressionist movements. It, it's fun to go back and look at the early art reviews of uh, uh, Monet and Gauguin, uh, not to mention Van Gogh, and they were pretty much hostile. Uh, it's as if these guys never learned how to paint. In the case of Cezanne, they thought, well, the damn painting is unfinished. You know, why didn't he get busy and finish the rest of the painting? Uh, and what happened is a very important development in the history of art, and that is that the relationship, the, the art object is no longer a neutral object, which is then surveyed by the spectator for the aesthetic experience, but rather the aesthetic experience lies in a relationship between the object and the perceiver. So the perceiver has to contribute something uh, to the relationship and the aesthetic experience is not a passive experience of the perception of the object, but it is a re relationship between the object and the perceiver. Now there's a lot of nonsense talked about this and let me expose uh, some of it. Uh, it is often said by people who ought to know better that the reason that Greco painted those really elongated pictures, that the figures are so elongated, is that Greco had an eye defect, and his eye defect made people look elongated. But if that were right, it, it does, I mean, it couldn't make any sense, because let's suppose that there's a guy who looks like this, or an object that looks like that to me, and it looks like that to Greco, long and thin. Okay, now if Greco is going to paint it the way he sees it, then what's it going to look like? It's going to look like this to me, right? Because he sees this as that, so if he's going to paint what he sees, he's got to paint something that looks like that to me. Does everybody see that point? <laughs> if he really painted something that looked long and elongated to me, then it would have to look to him like this. Does everybody follow this point? So the idea that Greco painted elongated figures because they actually looked elongated to him, if he's actually producing what he sees, then it ought to look perfectly normal to us. If we produce something that looked elongated to him as, as his normal picture looks to us, then it would look like that to him. It would look really, it would look like that to us. It would look really ridiculously long. Yeah. And I think if you think about this, the theory that the Impressionists had was a nonsensical theory. I'm glad I didn't have a chance to tell them that because they, they did great art on the base of a false theory. The theory was we won't produce the actual object, but just what we see. We'll just produce what we actually see. But of course, what you actually see is an object. There's no way to depict your own uh, uh, visual experience. The only way to depict your visual experience is to depict the object that you are seeing. However, though I think they had an incoherent theory of what they were doing, uh, they did produce uh, wonderful works of art. It was a, a major revolution. Now, I got to the point where I thought I have to write an article about this, and I worked very hard on pictorial representation. <laughs> And I conceived, I now think, an irrational hatred of abstract expressionism. Uh, before I started working on this damned article, I, never, I, I wrote the article, and, and I can put it on the web if anybody's interested. I never published it because I don't like it. Uh, but I went through a whole lot of uh, uh, cases, and it seemed to me that the abstract expressionists were just cheating when they threw their damn paint around on the campus in the way Pollock does, or I, 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 in the case of uh, Rothko, I can't tell a good Rothko from a bad Rothko. Uh, they all look pretty bad to me. Um, but I, I think that was irrational. I was in the Chicago Art Institute uh, when I was working on this article, and I found down in the basement all of the artists that, I mean, Franz Klein and Rothko and de Kooning and, and uh, uh, Pollock and all the rest of them, and I thought, that's where you bastards belong, is down in the basement. But I think this was simply an irrational 
uh, well, uh, obviously an irrational hatred on my part because I got so obsessed with the problem of pictorial representation that it seems to me uh, that these guys were cheating by not trying to engage in pictorial representation. You see, Van Gogh is a very representationalist artist. It's just once you've looked closely at Van Gogh, the world never looks the same. No starry night ever looks the same after you've seen what Van Gogh does with a starry night. Um, and the, again, it makes a huge difference if you see a whole lot of these things. There's a museum in Amsterdam where they have a lot, it's a new museum where they have a lot of Van Goghs. And you get an impact by having a whole lot, uh, which you don't get in the way that we normally see the same pictures over and over reproduced. Now, that has a reverse effect. I once went to a Renoir exhibit in Paris where they had 160 Renoirs, and I suddenly realized this guy has, has no intellectual grip at all. He's only got two subjects that he knows how to paint, the left female breast and the right female <laughs> breast. Uh, but when he tries to do a landscape or something like that, he just can't bring it off. Well, that's a bit unfair to Renoir. I mean, he did do that wonderful boating party scene in, in uh, Washington. Uh, but still, it can, I mean, another painter uh, whom I uh, never admired very much until I saw uh, in Frankfurt 100 and 50 of his, uh, well, I, I, I don't know why we got off onto this subject, uh, but what I'm trying to convey is that sometimes the work of an artist is better conveyed if you have a whole lot of pictures where you can see the development of what he's trying to do. You can see his overall aim, which you don't get in a single picture. Uh, okay, uh, oh, I, now just to summarize what I've been trying to say, uh, there is a practice of pictorial representation and it rests on resemblance. I, and this is why uh, the abstract expressions are said to be non-representational. They're not trying to represent anything. That's what's, what's about them is abstract. But that raises a question. Uh, what are the limits? Can you do every type of speech act with a picture? And let's go through our list. Can there be assertive pictures? Yes, clearly uh, there are uh, any map is an assertive picture. It says, this is how things look. This is the arrangement of uh, streets in the city of Berkeley. Your uh, passport photo functions as an assertive. Its condition of satisfaction are uh, the bearer uh, of this uh, driver's license or this passport actually looks like this. Okay, no problem with assertives. How about directives? Can there be directive pictures? And I think the answer is clearly yes. Look at any uh, textbook on how to ski or how to play tennis or how to play golf, and they will give you directives as to what you're supposed to do. Uh, that is, you're supposed to have your body like this uh, when you do the turn, when you do a parallel turn in skiing. And indeed, uh, uh, the French have a wonderful, uh, I have a wonderful French textbook of skiing where they have negative pictures, uh, where they have a picture of what you're not supposed to do. And they show a picture of a guy and there are a whole lot of stripes on his right leg. And not because you're supposed to ski with striped pants on, but because you're not supposed to have your legs stiff. Jambe exterieur red, it says, <laughs> meaning the guy's got his outside leg stiff, and that's a no-no. So you can not only have uh, directive pictures that tell you what to do, but you can have negative directive pictures that tell you what you're not supposed to do. How about commissives? Can you have commissive pictures? Well, in the old days, barber shops used to carry pictures of the different kind of haircuts that you would get if uh, you ordered, uh, what you would look like if you ordered such and such a, a haircut. So the, uh, the, um, uh, the, the, the uh, duck-tailed uh, mafia cut looked different from uh, the uh, crew cut buzz cut or whatever, and they will show you a picture of this, and that picture is a commissive. It's an offer. You're being uh, told th th this is what you will look like uh, if you order this type of a haircut. And indeed, one thing I like about re restaurants in Asia 
is they show you pictures of the food that you're supposed to be ordering. You never know in an American restaurant what the damn thing's going to look like when it arrives. But in, in Shanghai or Tokyo, uh, you get pictures in the menu of what you're being offered, and those are commissives. They're committing themselves. That's a promise uh, or an offer. Uh, you order this, you will get such and such. So you've got assertives, directives, commissive pictures. How about expressive? Expressive pictures are I, the history of sentimental art. Uh, my favorite is in the Tate Gallery, in the old Tate in London, where it shows uh, a woman, obviously a nanny, a governess, and she's holding a black-rimmed letter, and a tear the size of a pearl is coming down her cheek. And the picture is called The Letter, and she's obviously received tragic news, and the picture conveys the tragedy. And as Oscar Wilde said about a similar thing, you'd, when you see that picture, you'd have to have a heart of stone not to burst out laughing, uh, because the sentiments expressed are so bogus and, and stereotypical. But in any case, clearly there are expressive pictures where you express an emotion in the picture. How about declarations? Can you have uh, declarations in pictures? Remember, we had assertives, directives, commissives, expressives. Can there be a picture that creates a reality by representing it? I couldn't think of one, but one of my students uh, in this very course uh, in an earlier year thought of one, and she said, how about in the, they're building a new building, and the guy gets to decide which is the men's room and which is the women's room by putting a picture of a man or a woman on the door in question, leaving aside plumbing differences. We'll assume the plumbing is the same in the two cases. Would that be a case? Maybe that's a case. I'm not entirely convinced that that's a case, but that's a case where you make something the case by representing it as being the case. Uh, okay, so when, today we've covered, well, cover is a strong word. We went through some of Chomsky, and I went through some of the uh, questions about pictorial representation construed as a part of speech act theory. Next time, we've got to think about the last subjects we cover, because in the final week, I don't want to introduce new material.